Amen. Thanks, Rick. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. We'll be in Genesis 24 today, continuing in our mega series, which for those of you who may not know, stands for Meet God Almighty. So we're trying to put ourselves into the shoes or sandals of the people all through the Old Testament, key people that we come across and trying to understand from their perspective what they saw and what they felt as they met God Almighty in all the varied ways that that happens through the Old Testament. We're doing it over two years. We've invited the church to be reading along and to have some sort of Bible reading plan. We're actually going to reinvigorate that early next year with a thing called the Bible Project. So we're hoping that this sort of becomes the impetus for you. If you've never read the Bible through in a year, that you'll read through it. But even before we get to there, before we get to next year, God willing, we're just asking that, yeah, you have some sort of plan to read around the sermons because we can't cover every bit of the Bible or we'd be here for, I think I worked it out, be four or 500 years at our current rate. Um, I don't think anyone here is going to live that long, not in their current state anyway, before the new kingdom and the new, the new heaven and the new earth. So, um, so we have to be smart about how we do that. But it doesn't mean that you can't, just because we're kind of skimming across doing this 6,000 foot overfly, doesn't mean that you can't be in the word yourself. In fact, we want you to do that. We want you to read around. So today we'll be in Genesis 24, and I encourage you to read the story of Isaac and Rebekah um, as we proceed through the rest of Genesis. Um, yeah, so I might... Uh, how are we going there? Cool. So the way we'll proceed today is... Yeah, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about Isaac and Rebecca. Um, in fact, no, I won't say any more than that. Rebecca the Brave. That's what I decided to name this sermon. Rebecca the Brave. I don't know if you've thought about bravery before or courage or the way that it can kind of manifest. Maybe sometimes you think of a war movie where someone's been brave as they charge the machine gun pit. Maybe sometimes you think of the pioneering spirit where someone's really brave and they just go out onto some frontier. Uh, Maybe you're just thinking of a more localised thing where you were once uncomfortable, you felt some fear and you were brave, you were courageous, you overcame that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Rebecca the Brave, but I also wanted to show you something. So this came about through the week, so I'll just show you. Uh, This is our sermon page on the willowburnchurch.com website. And as you can see there, we're in the Meet God Almighty mega series. And as we scroll down here, you're going to see a whole bunch of sermons already. There's already 12 up there, up to about 16 or 17. We need to upload a few more. So there's all these sermons there for the Meet God Almighty series. So just consider the amount of minutes, hours that have gone into you listening to that. These are the rest of the sermons. They're up for about... Three years worth, I guess. There's probably more we could put up. Remember the Gospel of John, 52 sermons over two years. Remember some of those? Uh, John's beautiful Gospel, we called it, introducing the life and light of the world. Then uh, we did Revelation over a year. That was pretty intense, pretty full on. We sat and, uh, and prepped for that. We prayed over it. You listened to it. And then there's all these other ones, you know, the identity series that Ben took us through. We had numerous special sessions, uh, little individual church camp sessions. They're all up there. They're all up there. Very, many, many hours of listening, many, many hours of learning about our big call, our big God, another sermon series, God the Spirit series. We had the, sorry, the Marriage, the Interview series, God the Spirit series. Remember that, the seven splendors of the Holy Spirit. So that's like three years, four years worth of sermons. And as I kind of scrolled through and, and looked at that, I guess I asked myself, uh, like, has it helped me grow? And then I obviously asked, because I'm sort of pastoring in the church, has it helped us grow? Has it helped you grow? Like all the minutes, all the hours that that represents, the days even that those sermons represent, you know, preaching the good word. And I'm sure there are imperfections all through those sermons. But the the thrust of those sermons was that we would know Jesus better, that we would fulfill our mission, which is we are here to what? Help me. We are here to love, we are here to serve, and we're here to grow. We're here to love God more, to love each other more. And we're to, to show that with our arms and our legs. We're here to serve. You know, service is love with arms and legs on kind of thing. We're here to serve Jesus. We're here to serve him in his kingdom purposes and his kingdom agenda. And we're here to grow through that. We're here to grow spiritually. You know, if you're a tree and you're producing fruit and it's 2014, 
When you come to 2000, at the start of these sermon series or whatever, you come to 2018, if you've got 100 oranges, old hope that in the spiritual realm you now have 200. You know what I mean? Has it helped us to grow? Because we are here to love, we're here to serve, here to go. And as we get into Genesis 24, you might want to uh, maybe turn there. It's like, <sighs> I was suddenly struck by this thought. How much teaching did this lot have? Like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah. Um, you know, Rachel will learn about later on and Lee. Uh, Rebecca, t- like, how much teaching did they have? Like, they couldn't actually log on to the internet using their broadband and just have access to so much information and i've got no doubt that many of you have not just been listening to our sermons you've probably been listening to your favorite preachers online but how much teaching did this lot have the people that we're learning about not much (laughs) hardly any i mean you can hold abraham's revelation from god literally in two cupped hands and yet look at him look it gripped him It gripped him. It compelled him. It changed him. It caused him to grow. So let's read. And as we've got that question sort of hovering there, Genesis 24, we're going to read sections. Like I said, later on, go through it yourself. Soak in it for a bit. Soak in these stories. Maybe get out a commentary or maybe get out a cross-reference and see where it connects throughout the New Testament as well. But as I read this, just consider how much teaching did Abraham have? Did his servant have? Did Rebecca have? Did Isaac have? Abraham, from verse 1 of Genesis 24, Abraham was now old and well advanced. In fact, he's probably 180 if you do your chronology. The Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, remember this chief servant was probably Eliezer, who was going to inherit all the stuff from from Abraham uh, until Isaac came along. So that's probably who it is, very well trusted servant. He said to his chief servant, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. This is probably some token of a covenant that people would do back in the day. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites amongst whom I am living now, but will go to my country, my own relatives, and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back? What if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land and who spoke to me and promised me on oath, saying to your offspring, I will give this land. He will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there. But if the woman is unwilling to come back with you, you will be released from this oath of mine. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. And so as we just pause there before we continue on in the narrative of this story, just consider again, how much teaching did they have and how much teaching does it take for them to grow? And how much teaching does it take for you to grow? How much study? How much saturating yourself in God's word? How much listening to sermon after sermon, podcast after podcast? How much does it take of God's word for you to grow? I mean, for, for Abraham, how much teaching did it take for him to grow? We've seen, we see growth, don't we, in his life. For the servant, how much did it take for him to grow? For the woman, Rebecca, how much teaching does it take for her to grow? We said earlier on a few years ago that we wanted to trust more deeply. I think you all agree with me, didn't you, when I asked that? I hope so. Was I just saying it? Do you want me to, sorry, do you you want to trust more deeply? Do you want to hope more deeply? Do you want to um, love more deeply? Absolutely. And so again, the question, I'm sorry to keep us bringing back, but it's my responsibility, I believe, as a pastor in this church, to continually ask and to challenge and to provoke you to self-reflection and to say, are you growing? Are you? Am I growing? I want you, I am not above you. (laughs) Ask me. (laughs) Like, ask me. Like, ask me in a serious serious fashion, in a quiet manner, have you grown, Adrian? We're all in this together, right? Shoulder to shoulder until the new kingdom comes. 
Have you, have I grown? And are they, you know, as we go through the lives of these people, we almost get to relive them. Are they growing? Do you think they are? you think Abraham's growing? you think his servant's growing? Are they growing in their faith, hope and love? You know, those three characteristics of kingdom people, faith, hope and love. Let's read a little bit more from verse 10. The servant took 10 of his master's camels and left, taking with him all kinds of good things from his master. And he set out for Aram Naharim and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was towards evening. Now, in two verses, that servant crosses over 800 kilometres. Okay, I had to look up this and look up a bit of archaeology online. I love the Bible because you can always find spots on Google Earth now. It's so good. And he has gone 850 kilometres. That's from here to Sydney. Okay, so this journey is not just down the range to Withcott. This journey is a long way. And Google Earth even tells us these days, or Google Maps tells us how long it would take if you were walking. And it's 173 hours, which I guess if you did 10 or 12 hours a day, you're talking, you know, weeks to get there. So this has been a long journey. So this is not something light that has been asked of the servant. Verse 12, he prays. So he's near the well. He prays, O Lord, God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. May it be that when I say to a girl, now, just be aware that Abraham is 180. Do you remember how old he was roughly when he left Ur and left his, his people? Remember, they had a bit of a stop at, around this area, around Nahor. It's probably over 100 years before. It's a long time. It's like, why would people even remember him? There's no internet. There's no emails. They can't stay in touch on Skype and FaceTime. He, he doesn't even know who's here. This, this guy's just gone there hoping that he'll show up and now he's praying and he's waiting. He's completely dependent on God at this point. He's just basically made a beeline to the centre of where his people were last known to be. May it be that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, she says, drink and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one that you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. I read a commentary and the commentary said, it was an old commentary and it said, this here shows a little bit of faithfulness, faithlessness by the servant. He should have just prayed for divine providence, divine wisdom to know who the right girl was. I'm like, this is why so often we don't read the commentaries first. <laughs> like, are you even listening to yourself? The guy's just traveled like days and days and days. I mean, he's been brave enough to actually go out. And now he's praying in a very specific way. That actually takes bravery and more faith in mind. You know, if he truly believes this prayer, to actually pray so specifically. Anyway, I just thought that was kind of interesting. But put yourself there. You know, you're this servant. You've been on this 14-day trip, 12 hours a day. And now you're here. How much teaching did that take? How many revelations? How many new revelations? Like when we come to church and maybe want a new revelation from the preacher, we want something to excite us, how much will it take? How much will it take to make us willing to go, willing to grow? You know what I see here with, the Abraham, with Abraham and his servant? It's so interesting, isn't it? If you just cut back a few decades, remember what happened with Abraham and Sarah when God made them a promise and it didn't work out for them? What did they do? Did they wait faithfully? Did they pray? No. No, they didn't. You remember? You can go back in our mega series and you'll see that they took matters into their own hands. They took Hagar and they had her sleep with Abraham. And as a result, a great big mess ensued. And you can read all about that. I won't go into it now. But this is a very different Abraham now. He's got a similar kind of problem. His son is to be the father of many nations. And yet, what's the problem? What's the obvious problem? No wife. Now, he's 40 years old, probably, if you do your chronology. So he's 40 years old. He still doesn't have a wife. And his dad's rightly getting worried. His dad's about to die. And it's like, whoa, what is going on with Isaac? He could have taken matters into his own hands. He could have easily have said, well, let's just get a Canaanite woman. Let's just get a slave woman from somewhere. It was all perfectly acceptable for a rich person in that culture to do that kind of thing. He could have easily done that. Or he could have said, maybe we need to go back. If I really want my family, maybe I need to go back. 
But you notice there he's saying, no, don't take my son back. The promise has been made. I believe the promise. The promise is here in the promised land. We'll stay. And I will trust that when you cross that immense desert and put yourself in the middle of some place that is now, you know, 100 years displaced from before, since I've known it, God will deliver. God will provide. And you've got so much mixed up in there because the the servant recognises straight away, even if I get to the centre point of where these townspeople are or where these, these family clan is, what if the woman is unwilling? What if there is a perfect woman and she's like, no, I'm not going with some strange person across the desert to some country that I've never been to. There's so much mixed up. You have to not only trust God to protect you as you travel the desert, you have to trust God that he's somehow going to convince this woman to come as well. And so what I see here is amazing growth with Abraham and the servant. And it's so cool. Oftentimes Bible characters, you can trace them out from their early days to their later days and you can see the 200, 300, 400 spiritual oranges that have suddenly uh, been produced. And I really want you to see in the mega series that growth is fundamental. Growth is fundamental. It is part of your DNA. You are designed as a Christian person, as a kingdom person, as as a kingdom person to grow, to change, to become more like your Lord Jesus. I love the way Ephesians puts it. It talks about... Uh, The Lord giving the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers to grow the body, to grow the church. And we're told that that growth is this. It is growing into the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You become more Christ-like. You become more like Jesus You know, plants grow, not just in, uh, you know, they grow in size, they get bigger. Um, People grow as well, not just in size, hopefully, uh, but in knowledge, in capacity, in ability. However, you get to probably a certain age from a worldly perspective, you start to get older, your body's starting to break down, it's starting to degrade, entropy has set in, and worldly, in a worldly sense, we're not going to grow anymore. Our bodies aren't anyway. And yet, if you're a kingdom person, as Paul says, even though on the outside we are fading away, even on the outside we are fading away, inwardly we are being what? Renewed day day by day. What a hope. Imagine if Abraham had that amount of revelation. How much revelation does it take? The Bible speaks of growth over and over again. Ephesians 4, we've already spoken about. Second Peter says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. First Peter says, crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow. Second Thessalonians says, uh, Paul says, I'm, I'm thanking God for you brothers at the Thessal- Thessalonian church because your faith is growing more and more. Corinthians says, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. We will in all things grow up. Grow up. Consider very carefully my next statement. God is saying to you, grow. Not me. He is saying to you, grow. Grow up. Mature. Become all that you're intended to be. Grow up. So have you? Have you grown? Have I grown? I think this is a question that we should visit over and over again. Are you growing? Am I growing? In all these sermons, in all this teaching, how much growth into the stature of the fullness of Christ? Uh, on Thursday night, we got together as men to talk about the church and to you know, talk about coordination and stuff. And there's a real sense of, am I growing? Are we growing? Uh, uh, I could feel it in the room. It was palpable. It was a sense of thirst, a sense of hunger. What does that even look like? I think, again, that's part of our DNA. That is, the, I believe, that is the Holy Spirit within us stirring us up, going, even at age 46 where I'm on the back end of life. What is there, Lord? I, I want to grow. What do you want? As a wrinkled old man, what will that look like? On the outside, faded away, but on the inside, renewed day by day. I think I saw it in my opera. He, he had so many... So many health ailments, he had the pacemaker, and yet there, like, there was a spiritual energy about him that was beyond his physicality. That's what we're talking about here. 
It's, it's, it's radiant, it kind of glows, it's attractive. And he wasn't perfect, he had his issues. But to grow, I love the way a verse can take on your personal history. You know, the verse is thousands of years old, but because you've um, placed in your life against some significant events, all of a sudden when you read that verse again in the Bible, you remember that event. And so when we left Community Baptist Church, I was given this little token, which you can see up there, which is just a steel yacht. And it says there that little verse on the sail, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you'll receive what he has promised. And the rest of the verse says, for in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. There is such a thing as anti-growth. In the Bible, it warns us about it. This idea of shrinking back is literally the idea of a sail being taken down. It's like, whoa, 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 ship's going too fast. Don't like where it's going, pull the sail down. And so this then became a word for cowardice. It became a a word for, uh, rather than forging ahead for God, but actually literally diminishing in size and shrinking down. And this was a really special verse to me because we use it on the no-tech trek as well. You need to persevere so that when you've done the will of God, you'll receive what he has promised. It became a very powerful verse through a lot of ups and downs, church upheavals, certain things were happening personally. You need to persevere. You need to persevere. And then this, if he shrinks back, if you shrink back, if you shrink back, God will not be pleased with you. I can't sugarcoat that. It's right there in the verse. If you shrink back, shrinking back can also be a word for apostasy, where you cease to believe. To me, shrinking back is when we act out of self rather than faith in God. I believe we see it in Abraham. He shrinks back when the promise isn't fulfilled. Instead of continuing to trust God, even when it seems completely impossible, he shrinks back and he begins to act out of self. Shrinking back is never neutral. It always then means you revert to your own resources, your own strength, and then the consequences that come from that. But now, does he shrink back? No, he doesn't shrink back. Does the servant shrink back when he's told to go into this unknown journey? No. Does Rebecca shrink back? I don't know. We haven't got there yet in the story. (laughs) You guys know the story, of course. So they call Rebecca... Um, Now remember the servant, and we won't go through the whole story, but the servant after Rebecca comes out, Rebecca feeds the camels, uh, waters the camels. And again, that's like, that's something that goes on for hours. And it's a beautiful scene. I'll let you read it another time. You know, she's beautiful. She's strong. She's generous. She waters the camels. I don't know, you've probably seen this before, but one camel drinks like 200 litres in three minutes. (laughs) So say you had three camels, 600 litres. You know how much 600 litres is? How many buckets that is? out of the well and she I'm thinking to myself what is this servant doing like I'm like just watching this woman just <laughs> anyway maybe that's a cultural thing but she waters the camels of a stranger she doesn't even know who he is yet and so the story progresses The servant is taken to the household of Rebecca. There's uh, two guys there, uh, Laban and Bethuel. Laban, we're going to learn more about later on. He's a little bit of a slippery character, we find out later on. And already you can probably see a little bit of that. And like I said, read through the story yourself to find that out. But when we go to verse 52, the servant has relayed to Laban and Bethuel um, my... Uh, uh, re, re, sorry, start again. Has relayed to him Abraham's wishes, the, the state of Abraham's household, and so forth. And in verse 52, um, the servant has just listened to Laban and, and Bethuel, and, and this is what, what, what happens. When Abraham's servant heard what they said, he bowed down to the ground before the Lord, and the servant brought out gold and silver jewelry, articles of clothing, and gave them to Rebekah, and he also gave costly gifts to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night there. When they got up the next morning, he said, send me on my way, master. He's really keen to get back to Abraham. But her brother and her mother replied, let the girl remain with us 10 days or so. Then you may go. But he said to them, do not detain me now. 
So do not detain me now that the Lord has granted success to my journey. Send me on my way so that I may go to my master. And then they said, let's call the girl and ask her about it. So they called Rebecca and asked her, will you go? Will you go with this man? Now, just think about the weight of that statement. This man is a stranger. The man that she is going to be betrothed to is a stranger. She doesn't even know them. She's too young. She has no idea who they are. She's being asked to go to a strange land to marry a strange man. Would you do that, Hannah? (laughs) You would want a very clear, you would want a very clear message from God, wouldn't you? And you know what's amazing about this is that Rebecca's even being asked because once all that bounty was given over, they could have just said, you're going. You're going, no matter what. And she would have had to have gone. Instead, they ask her. And everything then comes down to, will she be willing to go? Will she be willing to go? Will she be brave enough to go? This is what I mean by bravery, courage. It manifests in many different ways. She has seen a sure sign that this is from God. And again, the question is, how much teaching would she have needed to make the decision to go? All she had was the testimony of a servant who had the testimony of Abraham. That's all she had. And it was enough. It was enough for something in her heart to go, click, click, clunk, I'm going. And she says, I will go. That's why I named this sermon... Rebecca the Brave. And it really prompted me to think, am I shrinking back from certain things? Are you shrinking back? When you're asked perhaps by God or led by his precious Holy Spirit to maybe they're very basic things, almost banal things, but you go, no, I won't. Maybe there's fear. I think there'll be two things. I've decided there's two things that contaminate and choke our spiritual growth. One is fear. The other one is indifference. I'm not talking about indifference today, but fear. And fear is interesting, isn't it? Do you agree fear is felt? Do you agree fear is an emotion? So what's courage? What's bravery? Is that an emotion? I don't think it is. It's a choice. It's a choice of the will. So there is something behind your feelings. In this world, you'll be told, follow your heart. You'll be told, follow your gut instincts. You'll be told, you know, it's about how you feel. How do you feel? I love feelings. I love being a feeling, passionate person. I believe God is a passionate person. The the divine being has emotions. We see that all through scripture. Jesus weeps. Jesus gets angry, a righteous anger. But feelings aren't everything. There is something beyond your feelings. Many of you are waiting and praying for God to change your feelings. Rebecca would have been waiting a long time to change that fear of the unknown, that fear of the strangeness. So what was courage? What was it? What was bravery? It was a choice, but it was an empowered choice. It was an inspired choice. It wasn't a blind choice. It was inspired by the goodness of God. It was inspired by the promises of God. That is why people are brave. That is why kingdom people are brave. Not because they've looked deep inside and found bravery. We'll look deep inside. We'll never find it. When we look to the Lord Jesus, when we look to the power of his Holy Spirit, suddenly weak people are strong. Suddenly fearful people are brave and courageous. And what a question to ask is, you know, how how do we stop shrinking back? How do we stop stopping in a sense? Um, how do we stop that? I, I just feel like it's, it's like fundamental. Fundamental to who we are as a church. Fundamental to us growing. Here's the answer. It's also in Hebrews 10. My righteous one will live by faith. Faith is one of the richest words in the New Testament. And I think probably one of the most misunderstood words. It's almost often seen as this whimsical belief. And again, it's like, well, I'm waiting for my whimsical belief. Not that you say whimsical, but I'm waiting for me to believe strongly. God, give me belief, give me belief, give me belief. Over and over again. And it's like, nothing's happening, God. So it must be your fault because you haven't given me this faith. Now, I absolutely believe that the Lord Jesus, through his Holy Spirit, from God the Father, inspires our faith, gives us faith and so forth. But faith is not just belief. It's not just trust. It is Pure dependence. It is for, Rachel, uh, for Rebecca, depending, depending on God, 
depending on God for courage, depending on God for the, 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 the security where there is no security in the middle of a wilderness in a strange land with a strange man. If you are feeling fear, then that is a time to turn to God. I honestly think that faithful people are brave people. Faithful people are probably fearful people, but they've learned to depend on God. They've learned to be brave in him. So how does this faith, courage, dynamic work? I love this psalm. Let's do a little test here. The psalm starts off with, when I am afraid, I will. Help me. Try, yep. More, more, need more information. When I'm afraid, I will. I've got the answer here, of course. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. Who? In God. In God, whose word I praise. In God, I trust. I'll not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? You actually see the faith, bravery, courage dynamic here. I don't know if you see it. Think about it. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. But then the next verse is saying, in God, I trust. I will not be afraid. (laughs) There's a little bit of a paradox. I'm afraid, but I will not be afraid. And this is what, like, it's like, so in your humanity, so like Rebecca, there's a bit of fear perhaps. And then there is, but when I'm afraid, I'll trust in you. So the fear has become a trigger. New word that we all like using in society. Let fear be your trigger to pray. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I pray, so that's his promise, his promise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. So this is like a little journey that you'll go on, a little rhythm, a little spinning rhythm in your heart. Here comes fear. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. No, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. I will put my hope in your word. Do you know that, do you know that the little bit of word that Rebecca had was enough? That was enough. And maybe that's all it's ever going to be for you. Just one little word, one little promise that you're going to have to go, that's enough for me right now. I mean, we have the ultimate promise, don't we, of a new kingdom. But that is what we have to put our hope in, in God whose word I praise. And this deals with the fear. This brings courage. This impels and inspires the choice. And we know what happens next, don't we? Um, Rebecca goes with the servant. And then you see this beautiful scene. Isaac in verse 62, he's out living in the Negev. Uh, which is like a wilderness area. He goes out in the field one evening to meditate and he sees camels approaching. Imagine that. It's evening, so the, the, the light's starting to fade. He can just see the outline and he's probably seen many camels coming and going. And Rebecca looks ahead and she sees this man and she says to the servant, who's this? Who is this man in the field coming to meet us? And the servant says, he is my master. So she takes a veil, she covers herself, which is the custom of the day. And then a servant tells Isaac all that he's done and all that's happened. Isaac must have been like super stoked. <laughs> like, because one, Rebecca's very beautiful. Two, she's there. So he's not going to be lonely anymore. And three, God's been right at the centre of it. Centre of the whole thing. I just encourage you, you know, young women, young men, put God first. Put God at the centre of your relationship. Have him right at the centre. He'll make you brave in your relationship. He'll make your your, your relationship flourish. Put him first. It's hard though. And then it says here in verse 67, Isaac brought her into the tent of his mother Sarah and he married Rebecca. So she became his wife and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Isaac and Rebecca. What an amazing story. You can read more about Isaac and Rebecca. In the, in the following chapters of Genesis 24. But I want to leave you with this thought. We can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What a precious verse. You know, it reappears in Hebrews. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That's where we get our courage from. He's, he's actually not saying go out there into the wilderness by yourself. He's saying go out there into the wilderness because that's where I already am. That's where I am with you. Go out into the, into the frontier of your life. Go out into new and exciting things. Go out into basic things, everyday things, boring things. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. That's all for nothing, though, if we don't have the next part of this sermon, which is the one who was ultimately brave. They went to a place called Gethsemane. And Jesus said to his disciples, 
sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James and John along with him and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and he prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. What do you think he's experiencing there as a man? We know he's experiencing sorrow. It's so intense, this distress. It's so troubling. It's, like, it's the idea of, a, of water being stor- stirred up ferociously. I believe he's experiencing fear. The God man, who is fully man, fully God, is experiencing fear. And he cries out, Abba, Father. That's the most intimate, deepest way that a person can pray to God. Everything is possible. possible. T- take the cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And what you see in that moment is the most spectacular, grand display of courage you will ever see. Because he knows, he is God as well as man. He knows where he is going. He is going to the cross. He knows the separation that will occur from the Father. I don't even know what that means for a divine being. I don't even know. I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I can't fully grasp it. But it takes extreme courage in that moment to continue forward. It takes extreme bravery. Jesus is, is valiant in that moment. Jesus is brave in that moment. And because he was brave, we can be brave too. Do you understand that the Holy Spirit isn't just a whimsical force? It is the very power of God within us, the very bravery of God within us. And I thought I'd finish in a rather unexpected way because this is how my sermon preparation finished. <laughs> on my first draft, I went out to the fridge and here were these two pictures of our little puppy, Bonnie. And on the one side, there's like puppy school graduate and her ears are like kind of perked up a bit. She's all happy and stuff. And on the other side, she had to have a certain procedure, <laughs> which we won't, uh, we won't name in polite company. And that was immediately after. And I, I came out and I was thinking about bravery and stuff. And I just saw certificate of bravery <laughs> awarded to Bonnie. And I just, I don't know, just look at the two faces, you know. Because it's just like that in our Christian walk. It's like that in our lives. You, you know, these little kids, they bounce into life. And it's all like, wow, 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 cool, cool. And then, you know, bang, they start taking a few hits as they get older and the ears come down. But that's what you've got to teach them bravery. You can't, you can't just teach them everything's cool and happy and fun all the time because it's not. And Jesus is calling us to be brave. And I pray that we'll all get our certificates of bravery. So I'm going to finish off with Sila. So Sila, as you, Sila, as you know, is probably some sort of pause in the psalm, some sort of way, some sort of um, mechanism of stopping and thinking and praying. So I want you just to think about this because I really believe God has a message for us. I want you to pause and think deeply about each statement I'm about to make. Because someone was brave for you, you have now heard this message. Because someone was brave for you, you have heard this message. Think about it. Missionaries, some time ago, even if you're brought up a Christian, way, way back, someone was brave, someone spoke the word. And now you know, you know the message of hope. That's cool. Bravery is really about loyalty. We named our daughter Rebecca because it means literally to bind with a rope, to be loyal. If you shrink back, you do not show allegiance to your Lord Jesus. In that moment, you shrink back. You, 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 you show, in a way, a betrayal. And I know we're human. I get that. I, look, I've, there's many times where I've been, have not been brave when I should have been. And God loves us, but he doesn't want you to stay there. My brothers and sisters, don't stay there. Don't accept, oh, that's just the way I am. I'm still waiting for this faith thing. No. Make the decision. Make the choice. Like, Sila, just think about that. Bravery is loyalty. Finally, why haven't you been brave in the past? What do you think will fix it? More church? More teaching? more a change in your circumstances why aren't you brave Selah and I finish with a warning I, I was in two minds of whether to finish with this but the Bible finishes with it in the second last chapter and I thought no I, I, need, to, I need to share this with you 
So in Revelation 21, 6 to 8, John is told, It is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of water of life. He who overcomes, he who overcomes, she who overcomes, you who overcome will inherit all this. Or what? Read it yourself. It's good. I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Did you catch that? Verse 8. Who was the first person? What was the first descriptor there? But the cowardly. You see these other ones quickly go, unbelieving, vile, murderers, sexually immoral. Yeah, I get that. But the cowardly? You know, the lack of, the lack of courage, fear. What does it do to you? It takes you down this dark pathway. You think it's just no big deal, but it actually is massive. It takes you down this dark pathway where you are no longer who you were supposed to be in the Lord Jesus. You just go along with everyone else. You actually need bravery, C.S. Lewis has said, to practice every virtue. Think about it. You need to be brave to practice love sometimes. When someone slapped you on the face or you're scared and you want to go and you know, run away, you've then got to have courage to... to um, you know, be brave for your wife, or, you know, to, to remain uh, dedicated to your wife. It takes bravery sometimes. You know, the world more and more is going this way. The kingdom more and more is going this way. What do you think that's going to take to continue on the kingdom path? It's going to take courage. And again, where do you get that courage from? You get it from the Lord Jesus through his Holy Spirit. When I'm afraid, I will put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust. I will not be afraid. I will not be cowardly. I will not be cowardly. And I love the last part of Hebrews. We are not of those who shrink back. Do you realise? We are of Abraham. We are of Isaac. We are of Rebecca, the brave, when we do not shrink back. We are of the Lord Jesus family. It's not just genetic or faith-based. It's also virtue-based in a sense of because Jesus was brave, we're brave too. So we look like him. We look like our older brother. So I really want to encourage you to be brave. To be brave. And as we come to communion, this is a celebration of Jesus' bravery so that you also can be brave. This is a celebration of Jesus' valiant heart, his brave heart, the ultimate brave heart, so that you can be brave. And as you come forward, I want these words to be sort of ringing in your head. When I'm afraid, I'll put my trust in you. I'll put my trust in the one who wasn't fearful to the point where he gave up. I will put my trust in the one who went up that hill of Golgotha, allowed himself to be nailed to the cross. I will put my trust in God whose word I praise. I will put my trust in the Lord Jesus who suffered on that cross for many hours. I will put my trust in the Lord Jesus who went into that cold tomb. I will put my trust in the Lord Jesus who three days later busted open that tomb and is now victorious over death. I will put my trust in the Lord Jesus even though I have never seen his face. I have never heard his voice orally in my ears. I will put my trust in him because he has promised that he is preparing a kingdom for you and for me. He has told me to persevere. He has told me to endure. He has told me to be brave. I will put my trust in the Lord Jesus. I will put my trust in God. In God I trust. I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? Father, thank you for this precious moment. Thank you for this remembrance meal. Thank you for the time that we could have together. And Lord, as we sing this last song together, I pray that these words would just really minister to our hearts and remind us of your greatness, and your love for us. It's not a faraway love. It's drawn near. You have drawn near. And I thank you for that. And so, Lord, I pray that these words that I'm about to speak would be words that are found 
are found in obedience, in action, in good fruit, of words that are found in growth. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. If they shrink back, I will not be pleased with them. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe, those who trust, those who have faith, those who depend. We are those who believe. We are those who are brave. So help my brothers and sisters. Help me, Lord. This is a noble call. It's a high call, a grand call. But we need each other. We need you. So help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.